Hello Watch Enthusiasts! Now, approximately a year ago I produced a video which has really been extremely successful and probably my most successful video to date, and this was talking about the most underrated watches on the market. And this is quite an interesting topic in my eyes, because it is an area where a lot of brands do get a great deal of attention, whilst there are individual models from a few other brands which, which I find to be particularly interesting, and offering something really very different for the prices they, they're, um, they're presented for, which offer something which potentially a buyer may not have seen, and which may offer something more interesting. And in this video I would like to address 2018's picks, in terms of pieces which are both from highly well-known brands to far less well-known brands, and the individual models which I feel represent more than, um, than, than they perhaps are known for, and which I think perhaps deserve a little bit more recognition. Now the first watch I'd like to speak about sits very squarely in a highly aesthetically attractive dive watch segment. And this is a watch from a brand whom I, I had the, the pleasure to speak to quite recently, and is a brand which I'd like to show on the channel in the near future. And this is the Melbourne watch company Sorrento Dive Watch. And around the, the £500 mark in terms of dive watches, one has quite a few options from, uh, for example, Steinhardt, um, or indeed some of Squale's um, less, uh, less expensive offerings, which aren't at the present, as far as I'm aware, available in the UK where I'm based. But the Melbourne watch company Sorrento is, is an interesting piece, because it addresses something very different in terms of something which is aesthetically pleasing, and in terms of materials and design very rich, which I think is something which is lacking at this price range, and something which, which I appreciate enormously and as a result made the cut for this video. And I was able to handle these watches and really take a look, because I, I must admit, with smaller brands I do like to be able to see their products to really gauge the, the quality and their understanding of manufacturing, and here I found the work really very, very impressive. In terms of dimensions, this watch measures 42mm by 14mm, with a 50mm lug to lug. And as a result, the watch is, is quite considerably a hefty piece, with a fair deal of weight to it, but not in an overbearing sort of way, but where the emphasis has been placed in terms of thickness on the bezel, for instance, which is the aspect which will be most, most often be useful in terms of giving a good grip. But the variation in finishing on the outside of this watch is something which really caught my eye when I was able to handle this, and the fact that this watch has really been considered from a consumer's perspective. Because the watch has a really beautiful level of brushing on the surface of the lugs, which I wouldn't expect for this price range, and is one of the primary reasons I felt I really ought to, to present this watch in this video, because it does, it does pack a punch well above its price. The sides of the case are then polished with brushed elements around the, the, the crown guards, which also match the rest of the design, which is something which is often overlooked in terms of a design which works as a whole, but here this hasn't been neglected. The crown is also very, very well signed, and placed at the 3 o'clock position in the most classical of ways, because having spoken to the brand, this watch is a, a watch designed to bridge that gap between sports watch and dress watch. Now the case of this watch does have a 200 meter water resistance, which is exactly what you would expect for this, um, this sort of dive watch, which does bridge that gap between dressy watches and sports watches, but the legibility certainly hasn't been compromised. And we see this in the dial, which is a fantastic multi-layer design, whereby one has the top layer of a sort of a ceramic section to the dial, with that ridged section below it giving phenomenal depth to this watch, and of course we have those, um, those applied edge, um, polished edge markers, which are also luminescent at night. The hands are brushed in a variety of uh, facets to create a form which is, which is easily distinguished from the dial, but also provides a legibility and a clarity, but a beauty to it which I think matches the way the bezel has been formed. The bezel has a very interesting application to it, because it's a unidirectional 120 click bezel, but aside from it, the insert is a beautiful touch, available in either blue or black depending on the version you go for, as there is a white dial with a blue bezel, a blue dial with a blue bezel, and a black dial with a black bezel. And the bezel has been produced from aluminium, but it's a multi-layer aspect um, to it, because it has this surface which is, which is engraved in these waves, which give a beautiful format to this watch, which, uh, which mirror the, um, the lines on the dial, but being a little bit softer and, and providing a, a curve to the watch, which breaks up the design very well. And then beneath that, as visible through the cutouts, we have an enameled style of, um, of lower section, which means that whilst the bezel isn't uh, as heavily graduated as a professional diver's bezel, that's not the purpose of this watch. This watch is designed to be an attractive leisure watch, which also has a degree of water resistance and the format of a dive watch to be approachable for both those who enjoy dress watches and, um, and a more sporting style. The somewhat luxurious persona of this watch is only continued by the fact that it has this, um, this Melbourne sign on the back end of that second hand, which also has the paddle, which is again a typical, a typical nod to uh, dive watch history, whilst it does also have an anti-reflective sapphire crystal on its top, just to, to, um, to finish off the package. 
the 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 bracelet is a nice touch as well because it has this again slightly more um, uh, slightly more 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 formal rather than sports orientated design because it is a um, a style of of three link bracelet similar to an oyster bracelet with a polished center link and these very well brushed sides. But interestingly, it does have a quick release um, mechanism, which means that you can quick release the bracelet, which avoids all the fighting around which one often has to do with a bracelet, whereby one has to um, to manoeuvre two two spring bar tools, and um, one on either side, in order to remove each side, which can be a hassle and quite difficult to do quickly. Whilst here, having simply two two push buttons, one's able to very quickly release the bracelet and swap it out for a strap. Of course, the fact that these watches are made in Australia only adds a certain extra DNA to this watch, as something really very very different on the market to be appreciated. Whilst the movement inside it is the extremely well-made and reliable Miyota 9015, and whilst people do often um, often like to gravitate towards ETA or Solita, I must admit I've never had any problems with the 9015, as it tends to have, have a smoother wind than, uh, than, for example, an ETA, and also has um, a, 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 a comparable power reserve, as well as the same high beat, high beat run, while services are also potentially more affordable. So I'd say for this sort of price, it does make sense to have a Miyota in the watch, which will give um, give arguably better performance over the life of this watch in terms of pricing and in terms of um, or simply in terms of serviceability. But the most remarkable aspect about this watch is the fact that it's available for six hundred and forty pounds, and for a package this complete, I have really haven't seen anything comparable um, since uh, even watches that people often describe as extremely affordable, from the likes of, for example, Christopher Ward in the Trident series, have now risen quite significantly in price. No longer really are a, um, a direct comparison, making this watch really quite an exceptional piece for the price, and one which is often overlooked on the market. Now the second piece I would like to speak about is a piece which represents something which usually isn't seen for the price it's seen at. Normally an ultra-thin dress watch is seen upwards of the £2,000 mark, with a very elaborate style of manufacturing, and generally with, with a, a price which is inaccessible to most. This is why I think this Christopher Ward, which is indeed the, the C5 Malvern 595, is a very refreshing and interesting piece which I don't think has received the press and the interest that it deserved when it was released quite recently. Because this is a piece which is extremely slim at 5.95mm thick, but still represents a wearable everyday dress watch with a price which is affordable for most people who are into timepieces. Now the basic facts about this watch are that this watch is a 39mm stainless steel dress watch with a 5.95mm thickness, thanks to an extremely slim movement, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. But the design of this watch is very classic, it's very simple, but very very well executed in its simplicity. With a polished bezel, also with these polished lugs and wonderfully sweeping curves around the side of the case, which remain sharp and crisp, yet do continue this, um, this softer theme to the watch, and allow the lugs to appear quite small and short in relation to the 39mm case, making it really the perfect proportion for a dress watch. The crown is very, very well finished as well, with its um, its slightly pumpkin-shaped form, of course signed with that uh, double flag that Christopher Ward these days use. And I must admit, this is the first Christopher Ward I've seen where I actually think the logo works rather well at that 9 o'clock um, position rather than the 12 o'clock position, but do tell me in the comments down below what you think of that. And this watch comes in a variety of um, of different formats, but two main categories of watch. The first version is the Opaline White model, or indeed one has this um, this cool grey form of um, of powder-coloured grey dial, which is perhaps more subdued and something more, more subtle than that bright dial, but again, these are both aspects of the same watch, and so one can choose that personally. As far as dress watches go, this certainly follows the briefing for, uh, for a, a, an ultra-slim dress watch to be simple, because in this case it simply has the hours and the minutes, no date and no seconds. And in some ways I think this works extremely well, in order to reduce the hand stack and of course reduce the height of the watch, but more importantly, in order to allow the watch to appear as more of a simple and, and single-purposed item of, um, of horology. It's also manually wound, thanks to its, its ETA 7001, which is in fact the Pissu 7001, which has been used admittedly in a, high, a highly decorated and highly regulated and, and uh, adjusted form by Montblanc, and is very similar to, for example, the Nomos Alpha Caliber, running at 3 hertz, um, which is, uh, is again not a high beat rate, but thanks to the fact that this watch doesn't have a second hand, this is no real problem. The fact that this movement is manually wound also allows one to see the very beautiful level of Côte de Genève and beveling done to the movement itself and its plates, to really allow one to savour the wearing experience. 
The, the watch is also fitted with a double domed sapphire crystal, and does also feature these these beautiful um, uh, beautiful brushed, polished, and curved hands, which appear quite dark in their um, their their the glossy format, but do also match the indices, which are also similarly simple, very very well. The watch is of course Swiss made and does have that, um, that that ability to be a watch which one wouldn't expect to cost this price, bearing in mind the fact that it is just so slim at 5.95mm. And so with this watch available on either a, a variety of leather straps, or indeed on a Milanese bracelet for a little bit more, this watch is something completely unique on the market, in terms of being this minimalistic dress watch, which many people would aspire to own in the form of a Zenith, um, or perhaps a Gégé Le Coutre, but for a far more affordable price, and in a way which you can wear every day without too much concern for the watch's welfare, with an easily refinished surface to the watch being polished, and also a very, very high level of finishing throughout. And so for between £595 and £680, I think this is a really brilliant watch which is underappreciated for its price range, and indeed for what it offers. The third watch I'd like to speak about is the Seiko Landmaster SBDB015, a watch which takes a very clear direction in terms of a higher price range, but also in terms of being a watch which is quite potentially the, the ultimate field watch. And this watch allows access to one of Seiko's beautifully finished titanium cases, and Seiko's well, phenomenal uh, movement, which is of course the spring drive. But first things first, the dimensions of this watch are by no means small, with a 46.7mm case, with a 14.2mm thickness, though I will address this case size later on, because it's not quite what it seems. The watch has a screw-down case back and a screw-down bezel, as you can see, for added uh, resistance to the elements, allowing this watch 100 metres of water resistance, which is exa exactly what you would want from a watch of this type, in terms of being a, a highly legible and highly usable field watch. Interestingly, this watch has a unicorn crown placement, and that means that the crown is placed at 12 o'clock rather than being on either side of the watch, which is sometimes described as a bullhead in the case of a chronograph, but I do like to consider a unicorn thanks to its central placement. And what this means is that the watch has the crown out of the way, um, and in a place where it really cannot be knocked, in the same way as a crown placed at 3 or even 4.30. And so this allows access to the, the, uh, the functionality of the watch. And the crown is, um, is a match to the case, and the case itself is, is titanium. And it's extremely well uh, polished because it's, it's been used in, in grade 5, which is a, a grade which can be polished to a mirror finish, as seen on the sides of the case. Likewise, it features Seiko, Seiko's proprietary die shield, which I've had on my um, on my Seiko Marine Master, and uh, and has been able to to fend off all but uh, all but a few scratches on the inside of the lugs where the bracelet was, which is quite a um, an impressive feat for a, a coating of of a, a stainless steel or titanium case. The watch is also beautifully finished in terms of its polished elements on the bezel and also on the top of the lugs, which breaks up the design of this watch and the asymmetrical build of this watch as well, because as you can see the lugs at the top of the watch and at the bottom of the watch don't match, but rather extend over the edges of the wrist and curve around it to form a, a very snug fit on the wrist without it, it appearing too large or overbearing. Then of course one comes to the functionality of the watch, which is an area where this watch is simply incredible value. The movement inside this watch is a movement which I must say uh, is, is very highly revered, and it's the Seiko Automatic Spring Drive. Now, the reference for this movement is the 5R66, so it isn't the Grand Seiko level of spring drive in terms of their, their 9 range of movements, but still is quite something, because it's a 30 joule movement with 72 hours of power reserve and an incredible accuracy. And this is thanks to Seiko's uh, proprietary spring drive. And this means that you have a, a, essentially a mechanical movement with an automatic winding rotor, a spring, and all the other action, uh, aspects which you would expect. However, it doesn't have an escapement in the conventional form. Instead, it has a quartz crystal um, as an oscillator, and one has uh, the, the energy stored in a spring and, of course, wound like an automatic movement. However, this is delivered electrically, and thus it, it allows, uh, through a series of glide wheels, it allows the, um, the energy of the watch to be released completely smoothly in that second hand, which means you don't have the, um, the, the soulless aspect that some people see in quartz movements. You have a mechanical movement, it's just regulated by a quartz oscillator. And so as a result, you're able to have a watch which doesn't require battery changes, but also gives you the incredible accuracy that quartz does. And whilst Seiko quote the accuracy of this watch as 15 seconds a month, which is already baffling for a, a mechanical watch, this watch is, in truth, probably significantly more accurate than this, as I've heard reports of these watches running within a second to two seconds a month, which again is beyond anything you could expect from a mechanical movement. And so as a result, the fact that this movement is also consistent in this form only adds to the brilliance of this watch as a whole package for someone like an explorer. 
The watch has a sapphire crystal, which is anti-reflective, and underneath this you see a black dial which has different layers, from a slightly separate layer for the central section to that rim. And on this watch we see these highly legible luminescent um, areas on these uh, the indices, as well as the hands, on all, all, all four of the hands in fact, with also a power reserve indicator placed at the four o'clock position, allowing you to see exactly how much charge you still have in the watch, so to see whether you need to wind it up, um, or indeed simply put it back on the wrist as it is automatic winding. The date is placed at 3, and one does see the advertising of 10 bar, so 100 metre water resistance. The hands are straight and highly legible, um, despite the fact they look quite similar. The hour hand is wider, and the length difference is very clear. Likewise, the, the hands are fully painted white to contrast the dial, and we see on the, uh, the second hand white painting as well, with a luminescent back end to provide you with legibility in the dark. And this runs a smooth run without any ticking, thanks to the, uh, the, the accuracy and, and the way that spring drive releases energy as a smooth flow. Furthermore, a GMT function is also available, but doesn't, in fact, intrude on the style of the watch, as this runs a 24-hour run around the watch, in a way similar to a Rolex Explorer 2, however this is on the inside of the dial rather than on an external bezel. It is also luminescent, but doesn't appear as bright as the other hands, to not draw the eye away from those in a time when one needs to, needs to read the time extremely quickly, in a utilitarian form also seen in the drilled lugs, to allow quick changing of the strap. And so as a package for a price of between about £2,200 and £2,600, depending on the taxation in your area, this is an incredible watch in terms of what it offers, because it offers Seiko's, or Grand Seiko's, top-of-the-line technology within a, a robust and resilient case on a matching titanium bracelet with a really brilliant format and a design which is completely unique on the market. Now, in a world where in-house movements are extremely celebrated, in a way which is slightly debatable in terms of their real value, though of course this isn't the, uh, the aim of this particular video, I'd like to talk about a watch which is, uh, is something of a, an oddity. Because this is the Damasco DK14 and indeed the DK15, these are two variants of the same watch. And this is a watch which presents something very, very different from Damasco, a brand known for their no-nonsense sports and pilot's watches. And this watch presents a pilot's watch with a three-hand arrangement, a day-date arrangement, and a bi-directional bezel. However, executed to the very highest extent of what can be done with these materials, where every aspect of the watch has been considered and improved, with indeed an in-house movement, which has been produced by the brand, and to an extremely high level of quality, with aspects that uh, you wouldn't dream of seeing at this particular price range, making it really a remarkable proposition. Whilst watches from Zinn these days are starting to become quite well recognised amongst enthusiasts and simply people who enjoy very, very well-made sports watches, I think Damasco rather undeservedly still remain under the radar, and the quality of these products is, is very, very impressive. Now, starting with the case of this watch, which is 42mm by 13.9mm, um, albeit it is 43.8mm at the bezel, though this is very much an overhang for added uh, grip on it. And the case itself is nickel-free, ice-hardened stainless steel, um, made specifically for these watches, which is hardened to 710 Vickers, giving it very, very impressive scratch resistance throughout the metal, rather than simply having a surface coating. Likewise, it, uh, it also does feature a, a degree of further case finishing on the bezel, or indeed on the blacked-out versions, which feature Damasco's Damest layer, which is that black layer, which is extremely abrasion-resistant, and in fact uh, hardens the surface of the watch even further to the elements in terms of, of abrasion, bumps, and knocks. Whilst on the subject of the bezel of this watch, in terms of, uh, of uh, effect here, the bezel has a, a very, very well-designed, as I've said, Damest-layered uh, bezel insert, but likewise the bezel itself is attached in a way which is, uh, which is rather different, because it has a ceramic ball-bearing base to it, which allows it to, to retain its, uh, its crisp um, uh, bi-directional movement, and likewise is available in 12-hour or 60-minute versions, depending on what you'd like to use the watch for, whether you're going to use the bezel as a GMT function, or indeed for timing things, though that said you can time things on the 12-hour bezel, just by remembering that you're not timing in hours, but rather in 5-minute increments. The crown of this watch is also a very, very well-designed piece, because it has permanent lubrication in terms of its system, allowing it to have a smooth entry into the case, thanks to the fact that it decouples when it's screwed in, and as a result doesn't wind the watch as it's screwed into its mountings. It is also protected, as you can see, and is, um, is, uh, is, is uh, given the, the use of Viton O-rings, which are seen elsewhere on the watch as well, which are extremely chemical-resistant whilst likewise the, um, the crystal gaskets are also UV resistant in order to protect the watch from degradation over time. Despite the fact that the watch does have an exhibition case back, it does retain a certain um, anti-magnetism, which I'll explain later on when I'm talking about the movement. 
but also one has a, a water resistance of 100 metres thanks to a screw down crown, as well as a negative pressure resistant feature, meaning that if you're in the, the cabin of an aircraft and sudden decompression hits, the, uh, the crystal of the watch won't be blown out, as will be the case on a lot of other watches, um, and thus enables the watch to be a very complete pilot's watch, as far as a piece that will remain uh, resistant and functioning under all circumstances. The dial is a fantastic matte black, or indeed a white, and the matte black version um, features these, um, these wonderful crosshairs, as you can see, which are also featured on the white, whilst they also share that, um, that large, small second track at 9 o'clock, which doesn't interfere with the legibility of the watch, but rather splits the seconds away from the centre of the dial and makes it potentially more legible in terms of breaking it up. Furthermore, the large triangle at 12 o'clock also helps the watch to be extremely legible in the dark, whilst the black dial has uh, luminescence around the edge of the dial, as well as on that uh, triangle at 12 o'clock, and then on the hands, the white dial version is a fully luminescent dial, so the whole dial apart from the black elements lights up, making it extremely bright. Then one has uh, matching wheels for the day-date function, which is offset to the bottom at that 3 o'clock position, which is a wonderful placement, and allows the Damasco logo to really work with that balance on the dial. Likewise, one sees a very, very legible small seconds arrangement, and the centre of the hands is blacked out to match the dial, whilst their most important white sections, or indeed the, the opposite is true for the, the white dial version, allowing the watch to be instantly legible. The movement of this watch is an incredible piece, and is the in-house calibre A35 from the brand itself. Now, what's most, uh, most advertised about this watch is the use of silicon in this watch. And in terms of silicon, we see the EPS silicon hairspring, which allows the, um, the balance to, to have a, a lighter spring, but also a spring which is completely amagnetic, so uh, magnetic fields won't affect the spring itself. And likewise, it's much less susceptible to difference in position or shocks, thus making it a more stable timekeeper. Likewise, the, the watch has a silicon escape wheel, which again is lighter, and as a result suffers um, less abrasion due to the fact that it's self-lubricating, and thus doesn't need to be lubricated over its life, which is a brilliant addition. The mechanical innovations don't stop there, because we also see the use of a free-sprung balance, and this doesn't work like many other brands, whereby they have uh, screws on the balance. But instead here we see adjustable weights, and the advantages seen with these is that they enable the balance to be as large as it can possibly be, which is a, a convenience for the, the accuracy of the watch. But likewise, they also are more aerodynamic, and thus give a more reliable aspect to, um, to this balance and its timekeeping than having a conventional screwed setup. And without further gilding the lily of this movement, it's also beautifully finished with a, uh, an, a, a manufactured in-house rotor as well as that movement, which is very, very well finished in a darker colour to further emphasise the, uh, the technical aspect to a really beautiful movement. And this is topped off by a 52-hour power reserve, giving the watch a very comfortably long power reserve for accurate use. And so for just over £3,000, this is quite an incredible package, bearing in mind it has technology that watches over twice the price of this watch simply don't have in many cases. And so as a result, whilst this watch is very much aimed towards the technical person who enjoys these styles of watches, I must admit, I think for anyone who enjoys good technology, this is an incredible piece to have in a collection, and one which is highly underrated due to the fact that Damasco may not be the most well-known of brands, but what they produce here with this in-house movement is absolutely unprecedented in terms of, um, of this price range and this accessibility. And it is stated that Damasco are a smaller brand, and as a result the, um, the, the waiting time for these watches may be a tad longer than, um, than one, would, one would wait for, for example, a watch that's already in a shop. But certainly for this technology I'd be happy to wait a fair while, especially bearing in mind that it's from a small manufacturer that make these pieces in-house, which only adds to the, um, the care one can see behind this watch as a very, very impressive and unique technical timepiece. Now the next watch may come as a bit of a surprise, and this is the final watch in this video. And this is the 38mm Zenith El Primero. And the watch may come as, as, as a surprise because it's by no means an under underappreciated watch, However, it is underrated, because though one sees these very often in shops, one seldom sees one ever on the wrist of an owner, or indeed worn as a daily wearer. And this is quite a sad, uh, sad truth, because whilst a Rolex Daytona will set you back just over £9,000 if you, if you wait the, um, the full waiting list for these pieces in stainless steel, you will be spending that price, or indeed if you choose not to wait, then buying one in good condition on the used market can, can cost up to £16,500. And so for one of those Daytonas, right here and now, you could get, in the same time scale three Zenith El Primeros. Because these watches are £5,500 in stainless steel, 
or indeed in the case of the two-tone version, six six thousand seven hundred pounds, which incidentally is a comparison to the twelve thousand four hundred of the Rolex Daytona. And so one does have to th- have to wonder with these watches, why these watches are so so underappreciated, because these are beautifully finished stainless steel watches, which albeit do have a slightly more dressy appeal than the um, Daytona, as it doesn't have the large external bezel and is a slightly smaller size, but still represents a real milestone in horology. The design of this watch is unmistakable, with a design which remains almost untouched since its inception in 1969. And historically this watch is very important, because it is arguably the first automatic chronograph. And the reason why I say arguably is because technically the calibre 11 from Hoyer did come out before it, but that was a modular chronograph, and so as a result featured a a, a standard base calibre with a Dubois de Prat chronograph module based on, uh, or at least attached to it. By contrast, this movement was entirely integrated, built from the ground up, which in many ways does, deserves more respect as a movement in its own right. And there is debate that Seiko brought out their own uh, chronograph movement um, in the, of the automatic form before both of these manufacturers. And this remains slightly uncertain. However, one could at least argue this, is, this, is, this was the first integrated luxury Swiss automatic chronograph. Likewise, it also features a high beat rate, so 36,000 vibrations per hour, which equates to 10 ticks a second rather than 8 or 6, which means you get an extremely smooth sweep to the seconds, and allows you to, to, uh, to time things in greater accuracy. The movement inside this modern interpretation is remarkably similar, being the Zenith L Primero 400, an automatic 50-hour power reserve movement, with the date at 4.30 as with the original, which, which also features the 36,000 vibration per hour beat rate to give that smooth tick, which allows the tachometer to be all the more accurate, running up to 500, and of course an extremely accurate chronograph. The finishing of this watch is tremendous, with beautiful polished bevels down the sides of the lugs, and a watch which is directly taken from the 1960s, without that, um, that, that problem of the updates of watches, which means that this watch is both a vintage watch in terms of being true to the original, but doesn't appear retro, it hasn't been made to look old, but rather simply has remained what it always was, which I respect enormously. The pushes are also piston-shaped, which is a wonderful design feature, as well as an attractive crown, whilst the subdials are oversized, although their size depends on the model you go for, and, and come in these, uh, these various colours to provide uh, a brighter look and a slightly more playful look, whilst appearing all the more dressy than the, um, the, the Rolex Daytona, for instance, or one of the automatic coaxial Omega Speedmasters. The hands are also beautifully faceted, with a wonderful black element down their centre and luminescent base, whilst these are matched by, um, by very, very well-finished indices around the edge of the dial, which break up the black and silver coloration, or the black and grey or blue, depending on the version you go for, and give the watch a, a playful, but also highly, highly, um, highly considered, and also very, very elegant aesthetic. And so as a whole package, this is a remarkably underrated watch, because it offers a, a fantastic historical base, especially in a time period at the moment, when we appreciate luxury vintage-inspired watches, whilst this watch fits into both categories, yet in a way which simply isn't seen elsewhere on the market, and so makes this watch a highly desirable product, but one which is unique and you most likely won't see another person wearing one of these watches, despite the fact they're seen in shop windows very often. And so you get a high beat movement, a real history, and beautiful finishing as you can see throughout, which makes for an extremely interesting option for someone who wants a luxury wristwatch and a luxury chronograph at that, with a price of between £5,500 for the steel and £6,700 for the two-tone, and these prices are the versions on the straps. And so whilst this video was merely a glimpse into underrated watches on the market, I think the watches I've chosen show a quite a broad spectrum, that of course there are other options on the market, and certainly this is by no means a comprehensive list. And so do tell me in the comments down below what you thought of these choices, and if there was anything else you would have included, because of course there's such a wide range of watches which can be considered as underrated from a variety of different sources. And if you did enjoy the video, then please do like, share and subscribe to help the channel, and to be able to, to enjoy more content here in future. So thank you very much for watching, this is Simon the Watch Guy, out.